experience something like no. that? No. And I think we also need to be realistic. We need to temper our expectations because we've been hearing the same story for how many sonas? I mean, we come here year after year after year. When last did you hear a good story about economic growth in South Africa? When last did you hear a real good story about a dent in the unemployment statistics? You know, these are the real issues. We are unfortunately uh, going down a rabbit hole and deeper and deeper every year it seems um, and this is not for being negative this is our reality the statistics bear this out so what are we doing and my my worry Iman is whether there is a solution whether anyone has a solution somewhere in you know these annals of our government because I haven't seen it it is, as you say, you know, the reality and what is said in these sort of high places often shows a massive disconnect. People want to be able to feel as if they have a sense of purpose. There's a place that they're going to every day that's going to give their family a chance of progress, not just survivalistic, not just a pay living from paycheck to paycheck. Um, and that seems to be an ever, you know, elusive unicorn for many, many South African families. But there's a lot of pomp and splendor that's happening on the red carpet there, uh, Sakina. We are expecting to talk to our experts on exactly what all of it means. But uh, you and I have really brilliant researchers here at the SABC. Mm -hmm. So we can run through um, exactly what is going on and what people are seeing. So let's just quickly share with you how the process is going to work this afternoon. Uh, well, we talked about the fact that it's in three parts. This is public participation where the Civil Guard of Honor is going to welcome the president and so on and the guests as they walk along the red carpet very 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 important piece a state ceremony we're expecting a 21 gun suit did I hear something over here? Uh, something. Yes, yes you did um, but uh, you know as we can see and um, uh, I think you will have a bit of you on some things I will have a bit of you on other things because I can see passing behind you now uh, the members of the uh, judiciary. They are coming through at this stage. And, uh, you know, um, this is, of course, uh, part of that procession as it begins. And uh, we have brought in some expert help uh, to try and talk <laughs> us through exactly all of this, the meaning of it all, because there actually is meaning to all of this, Iman. Um, you know, we go through it time and time again. And I must say, this is a part of this whole um, uh, shindling that I actually enjoy. And you talked about um, the justices there. This is the uh, first part of the procession. The provincial speakers, the uh, provincial premiers, members of the judiciary, so those have all preceded the members of the judiciary. Typically, they go through the assembly chamber, through the main entrance of the National Assembly building. But as you know, we're borrowing the Cape Town City Hall for this event, so that's the entrance that they're going to be using. But let's bring in these experts that Sakina has been um, mentioning and kind of alluding to uh, this afternoon. And a really a warm welcome to you, Brigadier uh, General Martin Femi. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Professor Amanda Khos also joining us again. I want to throw it straight to you. We're seeing a lot of things happening. Sakina and I have done our best in interpreting. But talk us through the pomp and ceremony, particularly as it refers to all of the, the military milestones along the way. And welcome. Thank you very much. Um, uh, indeed, uh, this is a very proud moment for the uh, South African National Defence Force uh, because we have been afforded an opportunity uh, to usher our Commander-in-Chief uh, to the Parliament. Uh, in fact, the um, entire defence, it is represented here, of course, in the various uh, elements, in the various roads um, today. So that what you see now uh, uh, here, probably, uh, if I should mention, we have uh, the National Ceremonial Guard uh, that uh, has just uh, um, marched in. But uh, of course, we have the uh, all uh, arms of services that are going to uh, be uh, probably showing case uh, they are their skills in, in drilling and uh, marching uh, into 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 the, uh, uh, the 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 sauna today where we have the south african army we have the south african uh, air force 
and uh, we have the South African Medical South, South African Medical Health Services, and uh, of course we have the South African Navy. Right, uh, we are going to just put a quick pause on it right now as we take a break, and when we come back, of course, we'll talk you through more of what is playing out, and we'll leave you with these visuals for now. Back in a short while. And welcome back to our special coverage of the State of the Nation Address 2024. We are T-minus in military terms. Uh, what, how many minutes away from the official address? And I'll leave it to Brigadier General to tell us that. Let's just test. Uh, we have <laughs> 30, 39 minutes. Uh, minutes. And yeah. counting. Yeah, exactly. All right. yeah. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Vision is 2020, time is on point. Um, until the State of the Nation uh, address actually kicks off and you can watch it all here live on the SABC. We're chatting to Brigadier General Femi, Feni to just talk to us about the, the pomp and splendor. Professor Amanda Khos is also with us to talk about some of the big issues that we're hoping the President is going to have on his radar tonight. Didn't you love it when our reporters were asking the ministers, what do you hope to hear? One would imagine that they would have been around the table tooling their contribution to the State of the Nation address in terms of their report card and what they've been doing. Uh, isn't that the case? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but we, you know, we're wanting to hear what they hope and expect. Yeah. The reality is that the President has, a very, one, would, one, would, one would imagine, uh, Professor Gross, a very clear picture of what he needs to focus on and what some of the most important issues are. But as Sakina and I have been reflecting over the last few hours, we've heard a lot of the same thing over the years and not everything he's promised before has come to pass. Yes, and, and I think he's in a very difficult position because he has to make the ANC look good before the election. So we're probably going to have a lot of statistics about things that's been done in the past year. But what ne what's needed is direction on the big issues that really uh, failures. Um, like the load shedding, like transnet, like water crisis, um, lack of the generation of jobs, um, and, and, and the cost of living crisis for the citizens. You know, people are really struggling. Um, infrastructure decay. So all of this is addressed in, in every uh, State of the Nation address, but I think there needs to be a taking some accountability for failures. I mean, I think this is what the citizens will, will for them to make up their minds whether they want to vote uh, for the ANC in the next election. So, yeah. so who should take the accountability? 
I really think it, you know, the buck stops with the president and his administration. But I mean, I, we're not going to hear that because it, you, you want to paint a positive picture in, in a year that in which there is an election. I mean, that's the problem is that there is a selectivity around what gets shown here. But let's go to, and of course, there's been, uh, you know, a, a plethora of, um, you know, surveys and polls and things done about the ANC's, uh, you know, prospects in this next election. Some are saying, and we've heard this before though, Sakina, that the ANC is going to drop below its majority, that the EFF and the DA would be in close contestation for being the official opposition. The DA at around 20%, the EFF at 195 It's interesting to see how their election sort of trajectory has really sort of taken off. But if that happens, what happens practically in terms of, um, you know, things like who, who gets to, to, to be president? Some would say, you know, you go for these yeah. smaller political parties and build coalitions there, but paint the future for us where this Ipsos poll comes true. Yeah, well, if the, uh, the ANC goes below 50, then it needs a coalition partner, right? Now, the DA has already said it's not going to be them and they're part of the multi-party charter. So that leaves the EFF or uh, amalgamation of a lot of smaller parties and then there needs to be a negotiation about who gets what position right so if it's the EFF I'm sure that there will be demands made to be premiers of provinces or even uh, Julius for deputy president so but that that is negotiated right and and I you know we've seen how difficult it is on local government level so it, it will be equally dif difficult on, on a national level. Well we're going to take you inside uh, the chamber now and at this time uh, they are in lockdown so everyone who needs to be in is in uh, but let's just give you a glimpse of what's happening inside the chamber. there from inside uh, the uh, gathering uh, there today and you, as you know this is going to be our third sona that's held at the city hall if you haven't been watching the SABC all day uh, now you know where we are we're inside the Cape Town City Hall the National Assembly as you know in 2022 on the 2nd of January was gutted by fire and those repairs uh, Sakina you were in conversation earlier today around the scope of the budget for those repairs two billion rand uh, laid on and uh, you were asking questions around why it hasn't been done already. This is the third year we're effectively squatting. So so they do tell us that it will be completed next year, 2025. Uh, so um, the next State of the Nation address, which will be later this year after the elections, will, I would imagine, uh, perhaps uh, take place again here uh, at the Cape Town City Hall. Uh, but uh, it's interesting, um, the explanation that was given earlier by the spokesperson of Parliament uh, was about some of the complexities with regard to the operations in um, refurbishing the National Assembly, uh, because there was also issues uh, Simply removing the rubble mm. became a much um, more intricate matter because they still needed to account for all the furniture that was there, for the artwork and everything that 
may have been in the ruins there. Wow. So, yeah, so it, it's taken a bit of time. And there's been budget on their temporary quarters in place street for you know offices and things uh, like that for all of the parliamentary staff well um, there's a lot of detail in how the military procession and parade is laid on and I want to then um, bring in a G Brigadier General uh, Femi but I also want to welcome our SABC2 viewers thank you so much for being with us tonight and choosing us for this really important occasion this is the delivery of the 2024 State of the Nation address which we expect to hear from the President at 7 p.m. sharp the EFF um, you know their, their top leaders are not going to be present tonight because they lost that, that bid in court so what do you think is going to happen Sakina? Um, I actually don't know. I, have you seen any EFF members? I may have missed it. I have not seen any well, we of haven't, them. The only red coats are the ones behind yes. us. <laughs> and, and, and the ones we saw inside um, the chamber were of ANC members because uh, looking through it looked like ANC caucus members who were singing there. Yeah. So I have not spotted the EFF. Um, and oh, it's, we're already in lockdown. So they can't enter that it's closed right now so they cannot come in anymore so it's going to be interesting maybe who knows there i don't might know be i something on the, on the sidelines uh, as know. well amanda i don't know if you've got a comment on, on on this one and whether you expected it to be so quiet no well i expected the members who were still allowed in the chamber to be there so i don't know if they're boycotting this but is is that sort of also in contempt of parliament does that have a punishment i'm not sure all right, well, we'll have to certainly follow up on that one. But let's go then, um, if we can, to the process around what's happening. We've got a 24-year-old in Bongi that's going to be yes. leading the way tonight. We'll tell you a bit more about her in just a moment. But the official program begins with several processions. Akin and I have described the entrance into what serves as the chamber now by members of the judiciary and, 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 and others. But there will also be, uh, Brigadier General, the arrival of the presidential cavalcade in the, in the parliamentary precinct which effectively this Correct. is now. Just walk us through what happens from, from that moment on. Well, uh, once the, um, the president, of course, uh, as, as they arrive now, they've been allocated, each of them have been allocated time when they're supposed to be arriving. So as you have noticed probably that uh, they've started already coming in towards uh, that. So once then the president arrives, of course, he will uh, take his position, and uh, you will then see the uh, National Defence Force, of course, uh, giving the various salutes. Uh, one or that will be presented um, is the is by National Ceremonial Guard, which they will be doing the national salute, and um, you will also have simultaneously uh, the guns, uh, 21 gun salutes. Uh, that uh, is uh, going to be fired, uh, 21 um, uh, shots. Uh, at the same time, there will be a um, salute flight by the uh, South African uh, Air Force. Uh, we are, today, we are going to be, uh, you know, gracing your skies with uh, two uh, Gripen um, uh, fighters. Um, and uh, will be also, uh, they will be accompanied by uh, three Hawks uh, 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 fighters. Uh, uh, that, that grouping will be uh, led uh, by uh, General uh, 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 Cooper, uh, who is um, stationed at uh, 85 Flying School um, in Makado. Of course, your, both your Gripens and as well as, as the Hawks, they are, you know, strategically so, uh, you know, uh, stationed at Makado. Well, yeah. I don't know about you, but I really love military hardware, but for peaceful yeah. purposes. Yes. But I, I love it. Imagine the G-forces in there. I, I'm with you there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so with you. I, I, I don't think we would be any good, you know, because uh, let's just contain it. Yeah. So, you know, we focus on the things that need to happen because as the Brigadier is speaking, I have all sorts of questions, Iman, but, but I'll park them for now. <laughs> <I> we'll <laughs> take so. them off air. That's for I the debrief so. uh, for later. But I want to just share, um, we were talking about the EFF and uh, and why they aren't here tonight. So they have released a statement a little bit earlier on. And what they, what they point to is really quite interesting, Amanda. It's a two-page uh, uh, release that they've sent out. 
they say the capture of the judiciary by politicians and narrow political purposes is abominable. At the center of the deterioration of Zimbabwe's democracy was amongst other the things a captured judiciary and we will not allow this to happen in South Africa. We'll talk more about that point because I think it's an important one but again Brigadier General take us back to what we're seeing on our screens now. Okay um, that what you seeing now um, it is uh, the deputy president that is uh, supposed to take his position before the president uh, once he's in, then uh, following uh, that, it, of course, uh, the, the president that will be coming in. Now, once then, as, as I indicated earlier, once we are done with our, you know, compliments, uh, then the president, of course, will move in, move in and then the National Defense Force will then start uh, withdrawing uh, back uh, uh, to the base because I'm, I'm not sure if you have noticed because we have started a bit earlier, well, I came in a bit, um, a bit later in the day. We have uh, the, the, the straight liners, the, these yes. troops that have, you know, th those are the elements that I mentioned earlier that are coming from the different uh, arms uh, of service. Of course, with their bands, um, uh, each and every arm of service has got its own band. But in this particular case, uh, we have the South African Navy that is, you know, entertaining you there, uh, or rather entertaining. Now, therefore, then the Navy, unfortunately for them, we then had to, you know, uh, uh, utilize the army, uh, army band uh, to, 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 to march them in. But of course, their training is equally the same. So it, it's not really an issue uh, who's training who. But of course, uh, uh, we, the, it is always ideally that uh, each service has got its own uh, band. So, so we have got all of those elements uh, that are deployed. But then we also have the step guard, uh, and uh, we also have the, the ushers, those uh, uh, the door openers as the the president gets in or the vips gets in they open those doors they give them their salute and then they move in so the, the, these are the uh, elements uh, therefore then that we are having um participating uh, in or what are the, some of the elements that are participating of course the other elements are not necessarily here but they are all around uh, making sure that the place indeed safe so we saw there the Deputy President of the Republic, uh, Paul Mashatile, and his wife entering there, being accompanied by the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Lechisa Chinodi, as well as the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, uh, Sylvia Lucas. So they have now entered. Um, I wanted to ask, Brigadier, uh, the Guard of Honour there at the door, um, the, where do those members come from? Uh, you know, are, are they selected? Is it the same people every year, different people? And how are they selected? Well, not, not really the uh, same people. All what we do there, we make sure that each and every arm of service uh, gets represented. So, of course, they come from different units. And uh, every year, uh, you know, we rotate them. We give this arm of service the opportunity and they select their own uh, people to uh, to participate. So each um, service gives two members. So also a proud moment for those members to be selected for, sure. for this opportunity. For sure. It's wonderful for sure. to see uh, that inclusion. As you watch the scene and you observe, you know, the cadence of the naval band, you're kind of invited to a mood. There's a sobriety, there's gravitas. It is a big, big moment on the South African political calendar, but it's also a big, big moment in a democratic calendar. In a year like ours, where we're marking 30 years of democracy, we're going into what is described as one of the most crucial elections ever. This moment and the gravity of it isn't lost on us. But I'd like to ask a question about the history. How did, is this part of the colonial leftover that we have these specific parades and the specific order of events at this design? Or is it something that South Africa innovated after democracy? No, not really. <laughs> These are the old military traditions uh, that um, whenever the, the, there is the state of the nation address, that the defense, of course, gets this opportunity to usher in the commander-in-chief 
uh, I'm sure you would uh, you would agree with me that the president, um, of course, has got different heads uh, as, the, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the commander in chief and the head of state, and of course, as the head of government. So the defense exploit that opportunity of ushering the commander in chief. So th th this is coming a, a long way, uh, you know, as a tradition of the military that uh, we will always be afforded that opportunity right up until the president, uh, you know, uh, walks in the parliament. Even when he has walked in the parliament, we will always have those two um, uh, aid camps. They walk in with him in the parliament, much as everyone else here withdraws, but they, they don't withdraw, they remain there. I'm sure you will remember at one point, uh, some gentlemen wanted to know, but what is, those are the aid camps uh, representing the military. So uh, these are live pictures and we are now exactly 20 minutes uh, from uh, the State of the Nation Address 2024, the last four, the sixth administration. And of course, we will have another State of the Nation Address this year. It is a general election year. So post elections, we will have another Sona and most likely going to be here at the Cape Town City Hall again. Let's just take you into some of that atmosphere as that band crescendos to a conclusion. Well, coming back to the studio, and, and they have been regaling us with a wonderful uh, repertoire of songs this afternoon. Let's go then to the political questions, because that dovetails with what we're seeing in terms of process, uh, Amanda. We talked about um, the EFF and the statement that they made about the judiciary. How do you read that, again, in terms of the bigger picture with regard to elections? I mean, this is an opportunity for the president, in a way, to share the successes of his party in an election year. This is the EFF showing its political muscle in an election year. How do we interpret these signals? Well, you know, last year the president said we need to strengthen the criminal justice system. So what the EFF is doing now is to delegitimize it. And we have to remember that in the cases where they won court cases, they had nothing to say about uh, capture of the ju judiciary. But this time it didn't go in their favor. Now all of a sudden the judiciary is captured. So that's so typical of the populist, right? They, they are opportunistic and exploit moments like this and it it does make the the government or the party in power looks as though you know they they have captured the judiciary which is not true we have a very independent judiciary so I think one of the arguments uh, that uh, the EFF uh, would have wanted to put forward, um, as we uh, just look at those pictures there, we'll speak over them, uh, we can see just uh, getting ready for the arrival of the President, the Speaker of the National Assembly, Norsi uh, Viwe Mapisa Nakula, accompanied by the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Mr. Amos. Masondo. So uh, that means they are getting ready. The president should be on his way, and we'll mm -hmm. pick up on that. And, and uh, the brigadier. He's wearing a South African suit, so. Oh, yeah, made in South Africa. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to see. We'll see what his sartorial sensibilities are all about. But yes, Sakina, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, so basically, I was saying um, the EFF would have wanted to make the argument, uh, for example, that by not allowing the six members who are suspended to attend today uh, that is basically denying those who voted for them the right to have their representation here in the national assembly today of course the courts uh, felt differently about it but is that a valid argument in any way shape or form um, should everybody be allowed to attend the state of the nation address well, the EFF could have sent the other members. We're not sure whether they're here today or not. But, I mean, we have to weigh up the, the, the privilege of attending a sonar versus the disruption of the EFF. And they've had many years of disruption that, you know, nothing happened. There was no sanction for that. This is the first time uh, that, that it is sanctioned and it was because they approached the president on the podium last year. So, I mean, they have to take the sanction um, on face value because they caused that disruption. So I, no, I don't think that's a valid argument. 
Well, in their statement, they're basically saying all energies now are towards uh, their, uh, the launch of their manifesto, which takes place in KZN. On and Saturday. On Saturday. So, you know, they, they, they in a way, are saying, well, whatever. It, it yeah. Yeah. And focusing on the business yeah. Yeah. of politicking and building their uh, grassroots support base. Let's go back to this picture, uh, Sakina. Another major moment uh, here at the Cape Town City Hall. Brigadier General, again, share with us how this uh, procession takes place and all of the things that must happen around it. Yeah, no. <clears throat> As I indicated earlier, that uh, once uh, the, 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 the Deputy President arrives, and of course the national uh, sp the speaker has, has arrived then now this is the moment where we are awaiting now the uh, the commander in chief so once he arrives uh, of course um, he is going to take his position and this is uh, where we are now going to pray, uh, pay our respect in the form of uh, the salutes that I've indicated uh, the national uh, salute by the national ceremonial guard and uh, of course by the uh, 21 gun salute and um, as well as the um, salute flight by the South African um, Air Force and uh, of course uh, that uh, will help in <clears throat> simultaneously with the singing of the uh, the national anthem as well. There's a timing, a very specific timing to these salutes, one minute and 40 seconds. What's that about? <clears throat> um, that, that, that indeed, that, that, is, that has been planned so that um, they, they, as they come in, they come in with their seniority. Um, I'm sure you would have noticed that. They are coming in with their seniority and everything has been planned for exactly how many minutes must each and every one of them take before they enter. So that, that, is, that, is, that is planned so that by the time that the president uh, should be talking, he must be talking exactly on the planned time. And what about the numbers? Are there any significance to the numbers of uh, those accompanying the president? You've got um, uh, some of the uh, uh, officers there on horseback. You've got some of them on motorbikes. You've got uh, the uh, motorcade coming through. Is there any significance to numbers here? The, I will speak of, 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 of the, the, the military. The, the, the president, uh, as he comes in, you would notice that the South African police uh, uh, that, that are part of uh, the escorting. But with that, we also have the military police with the motorbikes uh, that um, are then coming in, ushering uh, the president. Of course, um, it, is, it is standard uh, that uh, the, the military police will escort both the president and uh, the deputy uh, president as they come in but uh, now you would notice that with the president there is even the South African uh, police with the horses so in uh, no real significance with regard to numbers in terms of how many there need to be um, how many horsemen how, how many on motorcycles uh, is, is that not a thing in the, in the military you will, you will notice that there is a, a difference in terms of the uh, military police bikes. The the president gets afforded with about uh, uh, 19 of them, and then of course uh, the deputy gets afforded with the 17 of them. Okay, two. Yeah. So right. it's it, it's the, the the same, you know, with the with the with the, in the with the gun salute, they they differ. Uh, the the president of course gets uh, the 21, and the deputy. Uh, as again, uh, the, 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 the the minister uh, gets uh, uh, 19 and, and they so go down up until to a brigadier general. But remember, with the ministers, we only afford the minister of defense. The other ministers, unfortunately, uh, they do not uh, get the same amount of, uh, you know, gets that opportunity of mm -hmm. being given a... a, a a, a gun salute. A gun salute, no. So, so someone like you would, a brigadier general. Well, I don't think, be modest I, I, now, brigadier no, 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 general. I, no, no, no. I, I, I think I, I happen to be privileged because the, 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 the gun salute, they start from the rank of a brigadier general. And uh, they, they go up right up 
until to the president that you know yeah. as, as brigadier general gets the 11 and then it is 13 and then it is 15 you know <laughs> with that too until it is uh, 21 can salute which so, is afforded but particularly the the countries uh, which are commonwealth mm, uh, the, like south the, africa uh, yeah yeah because we're part of that uh, you know so so we we apply this 21 gun salute it differs then from other countries but those who are coming from that um they 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 they, they, they you know observe this 21 gun salute for the head of states um, the head of governments and so on so sakini you're talking about a brigadier general's outfit or his uniform just so that we can feel what it feels oh, we'll like just to have flank him salute. we'll just flank him we'll just go stand there flank him so that we can take all of that oh, yeah. in but and not, pretend it's not for today us. though hey. not today <laughs> not today um, i think what's so instructive about this moment is how it all plays into the concept of democracy educating the public about all of the things that are happening in spaces where the majority of south africans won't have this access this opportunity to sit right here or to be able to go into the chamber but through this broadcast through the commentary that you're sharing with us, the pair of you, it's mm. this deeper understanding of how all of these things work together. All right, the, the president is sitting to the podium and uh, we are going to pause so that you can take this in, of course, flanked there, as we said, by the National Assembly Speaker and uh, the Chairperson of the Council of Provinces. I felt that. That 21 gun salute palpable here in our studio we could feel every movement and what happens next is the president's preparing to enter the chamber and there's a protocol that applies members of both houses must be seated before that procession enters the presiding officers and the president enter the chamber in procession and they'll be preceded by the sergeant at arms and the usher of the black rod and then followed by the secretary to parliament we talked about the imbongi uh, who will also sing praises to um, the president, narrating the president's personal history, the president's clan and family lineage. And this is, you know, this is traditional in South Africa. And this will also coincide with the entry of the president into the chamber. So that's Indeed. also an exciting hallmark, Sakina.
and 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 she of course is from um, Bumalanga, uh, my home province. But let's listen in to uh, those proceedings inside the chamber. Speaker of the National Assembly, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, President of the Republic of South Africa. When they come land, bending is in Africa, not 1994, La Pocona, Bamba sending is in Africa, by your vote, Agu Kalanga. Wa soba be Solomon Kalush Mashangu, Wati Um Zabalazo, Usakumega, Hingabonem Zabalazo, Ebunfu, Sisa Wenda, Mapas, Bahulu Mende Wetu, Sigwani, Lessifiga, Sifo, Sekovit nineteen, Yabo Samelana, Sisa Salum Shaba Honge, Sapinta Saibon, Ningizim, Africa, Ilula Sanja, Ilula Palestine, Inganis Nema, Africa, Kolelo Wegoti, Umunfu, Mumunfu, Nebanfu. opportunity for silent prayer or meditation. Please be seated.
Order, honorable members. Honorable members, the president has called this joint sitting of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces in terms of Section 842D of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, read with Joint Rule 13.1a to deliver his State of the Nation Address to Parliament. Honorable members, before I invite the Honorable the President to address this joint sitting, I wish to remind all of us that in December last year, amendments to the joint rules of Parliament were agreed in respect of Chapter 2 of the joint rules, specifically Parts 1 and 2, which deal with order in joint sittings and the rules of debate. In this regard, I wish to highlight the following. That the rules provide that no other business may be considered during a joint sitting other than the specified business for which the joint sitting was called. Rule 15.3 provides that no member may interrupt the President whilst delivering the State of the Nation address. In terms of Joint Rule 5.7, a point of order must be confined only to a matter of breach of these joint rules or parliamentary procedure or practice or a matter relating to unparliamentary conduct and must be raised immediately when the alleged breach occurs. The member raising the point of order must refer to a rule or standing order, or at the least the principle or subject matter upon which the point of order is being based. A member wishing to raise a question of privilege must report it to the speaker or chairperson without delay in accordance with joint rule 5.8. If the alleged breach of privilege is, in the opinion of the speaker or the chairperson, adequately substantiated and may affect a joint sitting of the House on the day or in the immediate future, the speaker or the chairperson may, in due regard to the provisions of the Act, rule on the matter and announce it in the joint sitting. If the alleged breach of privilege does not directly affect the joint sitting of the Houses, in the immediate future. The Speaker or the Chairperson may refer the matter to the relevant committee of the House to which affected member belongs. Rule 38 stipulates that whenever the presiding officer addresses members during a joint sitting, any then speaking or seeking to speak must resume his or her seat and the presiding officer must be heard without interruption provides that no member shall use unparliamentary, offensive, abusive, insulting, dis disrespectful, unbecoming language or sounds or offensive or threatening gestures. Rule 57 provides that rulings by presiding officers are final and binding and may not be challenged or questioned in the House. In terms of joint rule 8, a member who willfully fails or refuses to obey any joint rule or order or resolution may be found guilty of contempt of parliament. As members are aware, the rules are there to protect the dignity and decorum of the House and to ensure that business before the Houses of Parliament is conducted in an orderly manner. Rule 41 states that if the presiding officer is of the opinion that a member is deliberately contravening a provision of these rules, or that a member is disregarding the authority of the chair, or that of a member's conduct is grossly disorderly, the presiding officer may order the member to leave the chamber immediately for the remainder of the sitting. I now call the Honourable the President to address the joint sitting.
Speaker of the National Assembly, Ms. Nasiviwe Mapisa Ngagula, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Mr. Amos Masondo, Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Paul Mashatile, and Mrs. Mashatile, Former President Thabo Mbeki, former Deputy President Zile Mlambo Nguka, former Speaker of the National Assembly, Ms. Baleka Mbete, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo, Deputy Chief Justice Ms. Mandy Samaya, various Justices who are here present, Mayor Brown, Councillor Gordon Hill Lewis, <laughs> Dean of the Diplomatic Corps and Regional Deans, the heads of institutions supporting our democracy, eminent persons representing our nine provinces who I just greeted a few minutes ago, members of parliament and fellow South Africans. As we were preparing this State of the Nation address, we were deeply saddened to hear of the tragic passing of Dr. Hage Gengob, the President of the Republic of Namibia, President Gengob was a dear friend to me and to the people of South Africa and a comrade in arms in the struggle for our freedom. He was a champion of African peace, unity, progress and development. May I ask that we observe a moment of silence in his honour as we remember him by rising. Thank you. This State of the Nation Address takes place in the 30th year of our democracy. On the 27th of April, 1994, millions of South Africans cast they are ballot in a democratic election, many for the very first time in their lives. That momentous day was the culmination of centuries of struggle, the struggle to liberate our people from suffering, from dispossession, oppression, exploitation, and poverty and inequality. As we stood in the long, winding queues to vote, we turned to one another and spoke of our joy, and sometimes with tears running down our cheeks. We embraced friends and strangers alike, encouraged by a sense of a common future that we were about to determine for our country with our votes. We place into these, those ballot boxes not just a vote, but a dream of the country we wanted to build. It was the dream of a South Africa that, in every sense, belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. The world watched as Nelson Mandela, the father of our nation, cast his vote in Inanda in KwaZulu-Natal. 
the land of Ushaga, a hero whose name echoes across the ages, the birthplace of John Langalebale Ledube, the first president of the African National Congress. An organization which united the African people and the home of Chief Albert Lutuli, the first African Nobel Peace Laureate. In many ways, his voting in Inanda at the place where John Langalebale Ledube is buried was symbolic because through casting his vote there, he was reporting back to the first president of the ANC on how far the struggle had been prosecuted. After casting his ballot, Madiba said, this is the beginning of a new era. We have moved from an era of pessimism, division, limited opportunities, turmoil, and conflict. We are starting a new era of hope, reconciliation, and nation building. It is this dream of a free and united people that is woven into our democratic constitution. It is this constitution that has guided our collective efforts over the last three decades to fundamentally change our country for the better. And it must stand at the center of the work that we do now to build a better life for all our people. Over the last three decades, we have been on a journey striving together to achieve a new society, a national democratic society. We have cast off the tyranny of apartheid and built a democratic state based on the will of the people. We have established strong institutions to protect the fundamental freedoms and human rights of all our people. We have transformed the lives of millions of South Africans, providing the necessities of life and creating opportunities that never existed for them before. We have enabled a diverse economy whose minerals, whose agricultural products and manufactured goods are exported and reach every corner of the world while creating jobs in our own country. As a country, we have returned to the community of nations, extending a hand of peace and friendship to all countries and all peoples. Just as we cannot deny the progress South Africans have made over the last 30 years, nor should we diminish the severe challenges that we continue to face as a people. We have endured times of great difficulty when the strength of our constitutional democracy has been severely tested. There have been times when events beyond our borders have held back our progress. The global financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 brought to an end a decade of strong growth and faster job creation. More recently, the Russia-Ukraine conflict has contributed to rising prices of fuel, food, and other commodities across the world and has, as a result, made life more difficult for all South Africans. <clears throat> there have also been times when events at home have shaken the foundations of our constitutional democracy. Perhaps the greatest damage was caused during the era of state capture. 
for a decade individuals at the highest levels of the state conspired with private individuals to take over and repurpose state-owned enterprises, law enforcement agencies, and other public institutions. In some cases, these activities were enabled by local and multinational companies. Billions of rands that were meant to meet the needs of ordinary South Africans were stolen. Confidence in our country was badly eroded. Public institutions were severely weakened. The effects of state capture continue to be felt across society from the shortage of freight locomotives to crumbling public services, from poor performance of our power stations to failed development projects in a number of places. But South Africans, including many honest and dedicated public servants, fought back and worked together to defeat state capture. Even then, attempts to thwart the country's recovery continued. We recall with great anguish the events of July 2021, when individuals loyal to their own interests sought to provoke a popular insurrection, leading to a tragic loss of life and widespread destruction. Again, they were unsuccessful. These efforts to, do, to undo the hard-won gains of our freedom failed because the people of South Africa stood firm together in defense of our Constitution and its promise of a better life for all. It was, it was the same determination that enabled the country to endure the devastation of COVID-19, the worst global pandemic in over a century. More than 100,000 South Africans lost their lives to the disease, and more than 2 million people lost their jobs. Yet it would have been far worse if we had not acted together as South Africans to stop the spread of the virus, to support our health workers, to protect the most vulnerable, and to roll out an unprecedented vaccination program. We were able to unite society around a common effort to save lives and livelihoods. I want to pay tribute to many thousands of South Africans who made financial contributions to the Solidarity Fund, to the workers who produce medical supplies, and to the nurses, the doctors, and other health workers, to our social, soldiers and police, who also risked their lives to care for those who were ill. Another major, another major challenge we had to address during this period is gender-based violence and femicide, which we characterize as the second pandemic. As the government, we have introduced laws and directed more resources to prosecuting perpetrators providing better support to survivors, and promoting women's empowerment at an economic level. As a society, we must intensify our collective efforts to bring together various efforts that are going to bring gender-based violence and femicide to an end. In in recent years, the country has had to confront the effects of climate change. 
We have had devastating wildfires here in the Western Cape, destructive floods in KwaZulu-Natal, unbearable heat waves in the Northern Cape, persistent drought in Eastern Cape, and intense storms in Gauteng and Northwest. Much of the task of this administration was to get our country through these challenges and to work to regain our way. While each of these events has left its mark, our country has weathered every storm and every challenge that we confronted. Yes, we have the scars to show, but in every case, South Africans have been resolute. We have not only persevered, but we have come back stronger and more determined from all these calamities that befell our country. All these efforts have demonstrated how South Africans value their freedom, a freedom that was won after decades of struggle. The story of the first 30 years of our democracy can best be told through a number of initiatives that have been embarked upon in the 30 years. But I think that the story can best be told through the life of a child who was born at the dawn of a democracy called Tenzualo. Tenzualo, democracy's child, grew up in a society that was worlds apart from the South Africa of her parents, South Africa of her grandparents and great-grandparents. Loko Tinsualo, Africa, Ka South Africa. Ukume Uri, Silu, Sotala, Aswa Afani, Nasilu, Swakali. Ukume Uri, Silu, Lesuendaku, E Hulumeni Waina, Isona Singa Kota Kursi, Sabito Mijaena, Pambi. She grew up in a society governed by a constitution, a constitution rooted in equality, the rule of law, and affirmation of the inherent dignity of every citizen. Tinsualo and many others born at the same time as her were beneficiaries of the first policies of the democratic state to provide free health care for pregnant women and children under the age of six. <laughs> Tinsualo's formative years were spent in a house provided by the state, one of millions of houses built to shelter the poor. We le are hard to allo, a huecha hurri. Dintu, dia ahiwa, di ahiwa ke muso, o mucha wa South Africa. Babang baile mba tswala pelo khaena, pele khaena, pane ba khulela dintu, zamarata rata. Empa, ye na wila rahatu alwa, akwecha hore muso o wa South Africa, u akhela batu dintu, zedinchinchi. Tenswalo grew up in a household provided with basic water and electricity, in a house where her parents were likely to have lived without electricity before 1994. Go 1994, Abanta Banning, you will elise Lagiti Bebeng and our case. Go to Utin Swalo, Ute Magazal, Watola Uti Ukes Ukon. 
ufagwe ukulumeli. Tinsalo was enrolled in a school in which her parents did not have to pay school fees. And each school day, she received nutritious meals as part of a program. That today, the program that today supports nine million learners from poor families. Hoyu Tinswalo, Dubana Duba Achiachi Colon, Osikachi Coloni, Gamacheron, Kazuma Zikoro, Uanana Breakfast, Kazuma Chikoro, Uana Zikoro, Masia. This is a site, Chipani Chakal, Zoba Zisio. Namusi zwa itea nga uri wuna mubuso muswa wa Afrika chipembe wuna kwa zitupanda. The Democratic State provided a child support grant to meet Tinsualo's basic needs. This grant, together with other forms of social assistance, continues to be a lifeline for more than 26 million South Africans every month. With this support, Tinswalo, democracy's child, was able to complete high school. Through the assistance of the National Student Financial Aid Scheme, Tinswalo attended one of our TIVET colleges and obtained a qualification. When Tinswalo entered the world of work, she was able to progress and thrive with the support of the state's employment equity and black economic empowerment policies. With the income she earned, she was able to save, she was also able to support her parents. She was able to start a family, to move into a better house, and to live a better life. This is the story of millions of people who have been born since the dawn of democracy. Whether people like it or not, this is the reality of many people in our country. But, truth be told, truth be told, it is only part of the story. For despite the remarkable achievements of the last 30 years, Many of democracy's children still face great challenges. Millions of young people aged 15 to 24 years are currently not in employment, education, or training. There are many who have a metric, a diploma, or a degree who are not able to find a job or do not have the means to even start a business. Now, this is a trend that prevails in many countries around the world. While economic growth is essential to reduce unemployment, we cannot wait to provide the work that many of democracy's children need. As government, we have taken steps to address the Youth Unemployment Challenge. I was privileged yesterday to be in the presence of almost a thousand young people. A thousand young people who were bearing testimony to how, through the various initiatives 
that government has put in place, that the private sector has also put in place, have been able to see progress in their own lives. Three years ago, building on the, on the experience and success of the expanded public works program, we launched the Presidential Employment Stimulus. Through this program, we've been able to create more than 1.7 million work and livelihood opportunities. Through the stimulus, we have placed more than 1 million young people as school assistants in 23,000 schools. If you go around our country and you talk to school principals, you talk to school teachers, they will tell you how beneficial this program has been in assisting them in their schools, but more importantly, how beneficial this program has been to these young people who are being introduced to the world of work. This has provided them with valuable work experience while improving learning outcomes. Through the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention, we have established what we call SA Youth Mobi as a zero-rated platform for unemployed young people to access opportunities for learning and earning. Over 4.3 million people young people for that matter, are now engaged on the network and 1.6 million have so far secured opportunities. We are working together with the National Youth Development Agency, the NYDA, set up a number of initiatives to provide opportunities for young people, including the National Youth Service, and the Youth Employment Service, where we are cooperating and working with the private sector. A number of companies in our country have signed up to this, as they have seen the need to join in the task of creating job opportunities for young people. These programs matter because work matters to people. The NYDA has played a key role in assisting a number of young people to start their own businesses. Having a job does not only provide an income. It is fundamental to people's sense of self-worth, of dignity, of hope, purpose, and inclusion. From the depths of dep deprivation and inequality, we have worked over 30 years to ensure that all South Africans have an equal chance to prosper. And we have sought to live up to leaving no one behind. It is not enough to recognize the injustices of the past. We need to correct them. We have introduced laws and undertaken programs to enable black South Africans who were previously disadvantaged and prevented from getting into many opportunities. We've also enabled women to advance in the workplace, to be become owners and managers, to acquire land and to build up assets, even as, because they are women, were prevented by laws of the past from doing so. The proportion... The proportion of jobs in executive management held by black people have increased exponentially, almost five-fold between 1996 and 2016. One of the overriding challenges this administration had to deal with when it took office was state capture and corruption. Our first priority was a decisive stop to stop state capture, to dismantle the criminal networks 
within the state and to ensure that perpetrators face justice. We had to do so. We had to do so so that we could restore our institutions and rebuild our economy. We appointed capable people with integrity to head our law enforcement agencies, government departments, security services, and companies often through an independent and transparent process. The credibility and efficiency of a number of institutions like the South African Revenue Service have been restored and their performance has improved. Some may not like this, but that is the reality that of, of, of what has happened. We set up the Investigating Directorate as a specialized and multidisciplinary unit within the National Prosecuting Authority to investigate uh, corruption and other serious crimes. Great progress has been made in bringing those responsible for all these acts of malfeasance to justice. More than 200 accused persons are being prosecuted as we speak. More are under investigation. Stolen funds are being recovered. Freezing orders. I see you love this. Freezing orders of 14 billion rand have been granted to the NPA's asset forfeiture unit for state capture related cases and around 8.6 billion rand in corrupt proceeds have been returned to the state. A restored and revitalized us has collected 4.8 billion in unpaid taxes as a result of evidence presented to the State Capture Commission. While the Special Investigating Unit has instituted civil litigation to the value of 64 billion rand. We have taken steps, including through new legislation, to strengthen our ability to prevent fraud and secure our removal from the gray list of the Financial Action Task Force. With the assistance of business, we have set up a digital forensic capability to support the NPA, especially its investigating directorate, which in due course will be expanded to support law enforcement more broadly. Legislation is currently before Parliament to establish the investigating directorate as a permanent entity with full investigating powers. But there is much more work to be done to eradicate corruption completely. Based on the recommendations of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council, we are determined to introduce further measures to strengthen our anti-corruption agencies to protect whistleblowers, to regulate lobbying and prevent the undue influence of public representatives in procurement. We will not stop until every person responsible is held to account. We will not stop. We will not stop until all money stolen has been recovered. And yes, we will not stop until even those corporations, blue chip corporations that were involved in state capture are made to be accountable. The real tragedy of state capture was 
that it diverted attention and resources away from govern what government should have been doing, which is to grow our economy and create jobs. Over the past five years, we have worked earnestly to revive our economy from a decade of stagnation and to protect it from both domestic and global shocks. We have made progress in a number of ways. Our economy today is three times larger than what it was 30 years ago. The number of South Africans who are in employment has increased from 8 million in 1994 to 16.7 million today. Over the last two years, the number of jobs being created has been increasing every quarter, and we now have more people in employment than before the pandemic. Yet, our unemployment rate is the highest it has ever been. Even as employment is growing, more people are entering the job market each year than jobs are being created. We have laid a foundation for growth through far-reaching economic reforms that we have embarked upon, and an ambitious investment drive, and an infrastructure program that is starting to yield results. Companies continue to invest. Thousands of hectares of farmland are being planted. New factories are being opened, and production is being expanded. We are on track to resolve the most important constraints on economic growth by stabilizing our energy supply and fixing our logistics system. As these obstacles are removed, the true potential of our economy will be unleashed. We set out a clear plan to end load shedding, which we have been implementing with a single-minded focus through the National Energy Crisis Committee. We have delivered on our commitments to bring substantial new power through private investment on the grid, which is already helping to reduce load shedding. Last year, we implemented a major debt relief package, which will enable ESCOM to make investments in maintenance and transmission infrastructure and ensure its sustainability going forward. Since we revived our renewable energy program five years ago, we have connected more than 2,500 megawatts of solar and wind power to the grid, with three times this amount already in procurement or construction. Through tax incentives and financial support, we have more than doubled the amount of rooftop solar capacity installed across the country in just the past year. We have implemented sweeping regulatory reforms to enable private investment in electricity generation, with more than 120 new private energy projects that are now in development. These are phenomenal developments that are driving the restructuring of our electricity sector in line with many other economies have done to increase competitiveness and to bring down their energy prices. Through all these actions, we are confident that the worst is behind us and the end of load shedding is finally within reach. But, but we are not stopping there. To ensure that we never face a similar crisis ever again, 
We are reforming our energy system to make it more competitive, more sustainable, and reliable into the future. We are going to build more than 14,000 kilometers of new transmission lines to accommodate renewable energy over the coming years. To fast track this process, we will enable investment in transmission infrastructure through a variety of innovative investment models. Retlaya mobile banaling chalet. Reba bise hore batle batlo sebetsa le rona ka go Kenya di chalet tsa bona mo transmission ya motlakase. Go etsa gore transmission ya rona itie. Last year we tabled the electricity regulation amendment bill to support the restructuring of ESCOM and establish a competitive electricity market. As we undertake these reforms, we are positioning our economy for the future growth in a world shaped by climate change and a revolution in green technologies. In the last three years, our country has, been, has seen the increase in extreme weather events, often with disastrous consequences. This is why we are implementing a just energy transition, not only to reduce carbon emissions and fight climate change, but to create growth and jobs for our people in the future. We will undertake this transition at a pace, at a scale, and at a cost that our country can afford and in a manner that ensures energy security. So we will not be compelled to embark on processes that are going to disadvantage our country in this regard. With our abundance of solar, wind, and mineral resources, we are going to create thousands of jobs in renewable energy, in green hydrogen, green steel, electric vehicles, and other green products. The Northern Cape, with its optimal solar conditions, one of the very best in the world conditions, has already attracted billions of rands in investment. We are going to set up a special economic zone in the Bukhubai port to drive investment in green energy. There's a great deal of interest already from the private sector with companies such as Sasol and many others who are ready to participate in the boom that will be generated through our green hydrogen energy projects. We have decided to support electric vehicle manufacturing in our country to grow our automotive sector, which provides good, good jobs to thousands of workers. And in this regard, we are already at an advanced stage of cooperating with our neighbors, with countries such as the DRC, which is well endowed with critical minerals with countries such as Botswana, which is already involved in parts of the value chain of automotive manufacturing. With all these countries, we are going to be able to form an incredibly powerful ecosystem that is going to enable all of us to benefit from the green energy revolution. We have decided to give special focus to regions such as Mpumalanga to enable the creation of new industries, new economic opportunities and sustainable jobs. And in the past year, we have increased the financing pledges for our Just Energy Transition Investment Plan from around 170 billion rand 
to almost 240 billion rand. Now, to address the persistent effects of global warming, which manifests itself through persistent floods, fires, and droughts, we decided to establish a climate change response fund. This will bring together all spheres of government and the private sector in a collaborative effort to build our resilience and respond to the impacts of climate change. Now, this decision was inspired by the persistent calamities that we are subjected to. Almost every year, KwaZulu-Natal experiences massive floods that destroy our infrastructure. Yes, the Western Cape is suffering from wildfires that continue to destroy quite a number of assets in our country. And indeed, many other provinces are actually suffering from <clears throat> the effects of climate change. So this fund, which we hope will gain the attraction of all, like the fund we set up during COVID, will support various areas that suffer from climate change to deal with severe inefficiencies in our freight logistics. We are taking action to improve our ports and rail network and restore them to world-class standards. We have set out a clear roadmap to stabilize the performance of Transnet and reform our logistics system. Working closely with business and labor, we have established dedicated teams to turn around five strategic corridors that transport our goods for export purposes. <clears throat> The number of ships waiting to berth at the port of Durban, which has experienced severe congestion in recent months, has reduced from more than 60 ships in mid-November to just 12 ships at the end of January. Now, that represents progress. <clears throat> Transnet has appointed an international terminal operator to help expand and improve its largest terminal at the port of Durban. And we are overhauling the freight rail system by allowing private rail operators to access the rail network. With the current conflict in the Middle East affecting shipping traffic through the Suez Canal, South Africa is well positioned to offer bunkering services for ships routed via our shores. We completed, as we all know, the auction of broadband spectrum. After more than a decade of delays, resulting in new investment, lower data costs, and improved network reach and quality. Now, these reforms have a profound impact in a society in which access to the internet has, written, has risen dramatically over the last decade. Less than half of all households had internet access in 2011, compared to 79% of households in 2022, meaning that South Africans more and more are using the internet. Some use it to trade, some use it to improve their livelihoods, some use it to learn, but the internet is being spread more and more, even in our rural areas. Just this week, we published new regulations to reform our visa system which will make it easier to attract the skills that our economy needs and create a dynamic ecosystem for innovation 
as well as entrepreneurship. We raised 1.5 trillion rand in new investment commitments through five South African investment conferences, of which over 500 billion has already flown into the economy. To support growth in the mining sector, we are moving ahead with the organization of our mining rights licensing system and are launching an exploration fund to support emerging miners and exploit new mineral deposits. Through this, mining, which has been the bedrock on which the South African economy was built, will once again become a sunrise industry. Participation, participation of previously disadvantaged black people is increasing. Black ownership now stands at approximately 39% when compared to just 2% in, 20, in 2004. This is progress that is being made, allowing black people to participate in a key industry in our economy. Investment in infrastructure is gaining momentum. New and innovative funding mechanisms will be utilized to increase construction of infrastructure. The Minister of Finance announced this in his medium-term policy budget statement last year, where he said, we are now going to be able, yes, to fund infrastructure through utilization of innovative new methods. It could be build, operate, and transfer. It could be embarking on investment vehicles, as well as investment ideas that will enable us to speed up the construction of infrastructure. The Department of Water and Sanitation aims to enhance water resource management by initiating infrastructure projects to secure water supply and diversifying water sources to reduce dependence on surface water. Water being such a major challenge in our country is actually answering to the need of our people just to have water. Banubotala la Africa zonga, babula bula imati, batama bai biela kurmati abanaona, balava kuri, hienda kuri mati abakona. Bulk water projects are under construction across the country to improve water supply to millions of residents in villages, towns, and cities. The following water infrastructure projects are now in progress or have been completed. The Lesotho Highlands Water Project, which is going to invest up to 40 billion rand, is now in progress. Umzimvubu, that we've been talking about for years, has now commenced. Hazelmere Dam, Umkomasi Water Project, Clan William Dam, Zanini Dam, Loscom, Matakasi, Pipeline from Josini Dam, Giani, Pipeline from Nandoni Dam to Nsami Dam, Pilansbeck Water, Val Haramahara, and the Pipeline from the Val River to Hotazel. Now, all these are projects that are underway or have been completed. In the Eastern Cape, the Msikaba and the Mtento bridges are beginning to rise over the landscape and will be among the highest in Africa once completed. So if you want to find the highest bridge in, South, in Africa, you will have to go to the Eastern Cape. The steel used. Now, the steel used for part of the project 
is fabricated in Pumalanga, and the iron ore comes from the Northern Cape. In the past five years, Sandral, which manages nearly 25,000 kilometers of road, has awarded more than 1,200 projects to the value of 120 billion rand, meaning that the focus on constructing our roads, repairing our roads, yes, even attending to our potholes, is now underway. Yes, it is. Now, you talk to the Premier, you talk to the Premier of the Eastern Cape, he will tell you that many of the roads in the Eastern Cape are now being attended to. Similarly, when you talk to the Premier of the Northern Cape, he will tell you the same. Yes, in November last year, now listen to this one. In November last year, in November last year, Cabinet approved a framework for high speed rail, focusing, focusing initially on the Johannesburg to Durban corridor. As we grow the economy, we are making it more inclusive through this redistribution. Around 25% of farmland in our country is now owned by black South Africans. And this, this has been confirmed by an imminent by an eminent agricultural economist, Wandile Sishob. This brings us closer to achieving our target of 30% by 2030. And he says to me, President, we will have exceeded this target by 2030 because a number of initiatives are now underway to ensure that black South Africans have access to the ownership of land. In the last five years, we have supported around 1,000 black industrialists with funding and other forms of support. These black-owned firms employ more than 90,000 workers and contribute many billions of rands to our economy. Now, this is the revolution that is underway to bring more and more black people into the real economy. At the same time, about 200,000 more workers obtained ownership of shares in the companies that they work for, bringing the total worker ownership in companies in South, the South African economy to well over half of a million workers. We see this trend continuing to grow as more and more companies realize that it is beneficial to their own operations and their businesses that their workers should have a stake in the businesses that they work for. And we call upon the to go ahead and and increase the participation of their workers in the businesses that they work for. The reforms that we have initiated and the work that is underway will enable us, yes, as I said, to improve our logistic system, to achieve water security, and ultimately it will lead to the creation of jobs. While our challenges have never been greater, our response to these challenges will lead us to greater prosperity than we have ever known. One of the worst injustices of apartheid was the manner in which education was used as a tool 
to perpetuate inequality and exploitation of black people. Over the 30 years, we have sought to nation as a tool to create equality and to empower our people. Our basic education outcomes are steadily improving across a range of measures. The latest metric pass rate at 82.9% is the highest ever achieved. And we congratulate the matriculants of 2023 for achieving this incredible pass rate. And with each new year, learners from no-fee schools are accounting for more and more bachelor passes that are achieved. And as I have often said, this is the silent revolution that is underway, that the children of the poorest parents in our country are now able to produce past rates that are equal, that are even beginning to surpass the past rates that you find in former Model C schools, in your independent schools as well. This is the progress that we've been longing to see in our education system. At the same time, <clears throat> fewer learners are dropping out of school. We have increased funding for poor and working class students in universities and Tivet colleges significantly over the past five years. Over the next five years, we will focus our attention on expanding access to early childhood development and improving early grade learning and reading where we are already beginning to see progress. Moving early childhood development to the Department of Basic Education was one of the most important decisions that we have taken as we are now able to devote more resources to early childhood development and ensure that through cooperative governance, various departments of government do get involved in the childhood development programs augmented and led by the Department of Basic Education. Our, our policies and programs have, over the course of 30 years, lifted millions of people out of dire poverty. Today, fewer South Africans go hungry and fewer live in poverty. In 1993, South Africa faced a significant poverty challenge, with 71.1% of its population living in poverty. However, under the democratic government, there has been a consistent decline in these numbers. By 2010, the poverty rate had dropped to 60.9%, and, and it continued to decrease, reaching 55.5% in 2020, as reported by the World Bank. Now, this progress has been made possible by extensive support to those in society who need it most. Five years ago, we introduced a further measure to tackle poverty by introducing the national minimum wage as envisaged in the Freedom Charter. The decision by key role players, they being business and labor and communities, they took a decision to introduce the minim national minimum wage. And this has immediately raised the wages of over six million workers who support their families. In the midst of the pandemic, we introduced the special 
SRD grant, which currently reaches some 9 million unemployed people every month. We have seen the benefits of this grant and will extend it and improve it as the next step towards income support for the unemployed. These grants and subsidies do much more than give people what they need to live. They are an investment in the future. Many people tend to dismiss this and say we are establishing a dependent society. We are investing in our people and investing in, our, in their future as well. Social assistance has shown to increase school enrollment and attendance. It has also shown to lower dropout rates, and it has also improved pass rates. This is what social assistance to our people does. South Africans today are living longer than ever before. Life expectancy has increased from 54 years in 2003 to 65 years in 2023. The World Health Organization DG says this is a phenomenal, a phenomenal development because many countries do not just move from a 55 years of life expectancy to 65. Maternal and infant deaths have declined dramatically. We have built more hospitals and clinics, especially in poor areas, providing better quality of care to more South Africans. We are building new hospitals, and one of those, which is a state-of-the-art type of hospital, is the Limpopo Academic Hospital, which is currently under construction as we speak. Now, I had, anecdotally, a good representation of how our healthcare system has been improving. When the ANC held its anniversary birthday, there was a bus accident where five people passed away and scores were injured. They were taken to our hospitals in Pumalanga and in Limpopo. Now, I went to see some of them. And when they were asked that don't you want to move to a private hospital because you are on a private medical aid as a result of your job or whatever, Many of them said, no, we are being well looked after here. Now, I see you love this. Now, this is what I experienced in just talking to those people who were lying in bed, who were injured, who testified that they were being well looked after in rural hospitals in Limpopo and in Pumalanga. Today, 95 persons diagnosed with HIV know their status. 79% of those receive antiretroviral treatment, and 93 of those are virally suppressed. New HIV infections among young people have declined significantly, and yet while our health system has had great impact on people's lives, we are working to improve both the quality of health care and equality of access. The National Health Insurance Bill has been passed by this House, the both houses, 
and that will provide free health care at the point of care for all South Africans, whether in the public or private health facilities. Now, the bill has arrived on my desk. I'm going through the bill. <laughs> yes, I'm looking. I'm looking for a pen. <laughs> We plan to incrementally implement the NHI dealing with issues like the health system financing, the health workforce, medical products, vaccines and technologies and health information systems. One of the most visible, impactful and meaningful achievements of the first three decades of freedom has been in providing homes to our people. Today, nearly nine out of every ten households live in a formal dwelling, as said by the Statistician General. Where there were once shacks and mud houses with thatch roof, they are now homes of brick and mortar. There are homes with water to drink and to wash with, homes with electricity for lighting and cooking. At the end of apartheid, only six out of ten people had access to clean water. Today, the figure has increased to nearly nine out of ten South Africans. We are working, we, we are working to ensure that subsidized housing is located close to work close to education and other services. But for services to be delivered, local government has to work. Now, when it comes to housing, we are also embarking on new and innovative funding mechanisms. We have tested this in the Northern Cape, where we are doing what we call front-loading. And we launched together with Premier Zamani Sol a project that will result in 4,500 houses for a billion rand funded through the Development Bank of South Africa. Now, this is an innovative way. And we are now putting into practice these new methods of funding infrastructure to enable us to ramp up infrastructure so that the infrastructure build can power our economy and create more jobs. Too many municipalities are failing on governance, financial and service delivery measures. These constraints affect every aspect of our people's daily lives. We have started the implementation of a number of measures to address this problem by providing support to local government, including professionalizing the civil service and ensuring that people with the right skills and the appropriate capability are appointed to key positions. That people are not appointed because they know so and so and so and so. The presidency the National Treasury and COCTA are working together to enhance technical capacity in local government and to improve planning, coordination, as well as fiscal oversight. Now, through the presidential imbezos that we have held across the country, we have seen how the district development model has brought together all spheres of government and key stakeholders to address the service delivery challenges in communities. The district development model has proven to be an effective instrument to enhance cooperative governance, 
and collaboration. Through this model, we are breaking down the silos that we often find in government, where we enhance government departments working together, and all layers of government also working together, adhering to what is set out in our Constitution. We will continue to broaden and deepen this process. Tackling crime and insecurity is a key priority. South Africans deserve to live in a safe environment, to walk freely, without fear in their neighborhoods and public spaces. During this administration, we have focused on equipping our law enforcement agencies, which had been systematically weakened to do their work effectively. We have strengthened the ranks of the police through the recruitment of 20,000 police officers, as I announced in the past two saunas over the last two years. And another 10,000 will be recruited in this year as well. An extra 5,000 police officers have been deployed to public order policing. The South African Police Service has launched a very effective operation or initiative, which is Operation Chanela, as a new approach to target crime hotspots, which has resulted in over 285,000 arrests since May last year. The economic infrastructure task teams that are operational in all provinces have had important successes in combating cable theft, damage to critical infrastructure, as well as illegal mining. Through close collaboration with the private sector, we have seen a reduction in security incidents on the rail network. We launched the new Border Management Authority last year to improve the security of our borders and have already stopped well over 100,000 people who tried to enter our country illegally. Together with the civil society, we developed the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence. Together with civil society and as a society-wide response to this pandemic, around 21 billion rand has been dedicated over the medium term to the implementation of the six pillars of the plan, including the economic empowerment of women. New laws were introduced to strengthen the response to the criminal justice system, gender-based violence, and provide better support to sub survivors of such violence. Our ultimate goal is to end gender-based violence altogether by mobilizing all of society. And as part of this, we support the call for a pledge that men should be invited to sign to take and demonstrate, to ensure that they demonstrate their personal commitment to ending the scourge. Now, this initiative, ending a pledge, was initiated by young boys at a school called Benedict. They have drafted a pledge that men should commit and sign to. And we discussed it at the cabinet Lakota and felt that we, collectively as the men of South Africa as well, taking our cue from young boys at the school, should also be mobilized to sign this pledge. Women are also drafting their own pledge, which will speak to 
the issues of women and their experiences on gender-based violence. This pledge, yes, will be flighted publicly, and I will be, and the Deputy President, and everyone else in Cabinet will be the first to sign this pledge. We still have a long way to go to build safer communities, to prevent violent crime, and protect our infrastructure. But there is no doubt that a professional, well-trained, and properly resourced police force working closely with our communities will make our country a safer place. And it is therefore a further call for the setting up of community policing forums that should be effective, which we as government have committed to fund. Today, every South African can hold their heads high, confident that we have assumed our rightful place on the world stage. We remain committed to playing a constructive role on our continent and around the world for the realization of a better Africa and a better world. We will continue to play an important role to silence the guns throughout our continent. Our engagement with the parties in the Russia-Ukraine conflict through the Africa Peace Initiative are progressing. We engage in these peace efforts because we believe that even the most intractable conflicts can be brought to an end through negotiations. Guided by the fundamental principle of human rights and freedom, we have taken up the Palestinians' cause to prevent further deaths and destructions in Gaza. We know that there are some in our nation who do not support this course that we have embarked upon. We have, we have welcomed the ruling of the International Court of Justice that Israel must take all measures within its power to prevent acts of genocide against Palestinians. And we condemn the killing of civilians on all sides and call on all parties involved in the conflict to commit to a peace process that will deliver a two-state solution as resolved by the United Nations. We will use our foreign policy to pursue our development goals. During our leadership of BRICS last year, we witnessed a new chapter for BRICS, the BRICS family of countries. The expansion of the group from five to 10 countries presents opportunities for trade and a strengthening of political and diplomatic ties between countries in the global south. We will build on the progress we have made in establishing the African continental free trade area, which will transform South Africa's economy and that of the continent by creating new jobs and increasing economic participation across our continent. And we will place Africa's development at the top of the agenda when we, as South Africa, host the G20 next year in 2025. The achievements over the last three decades are a testament to the power of collaboration and partnership to address our most pressing challenges. Our country has a vibrant civil society, 
a powerful union movement, and an engaged private sector. Over the last five years, we have worked with these social partners to address challenges such as to keep people safe and to distribute vaccines during the COVID-19 pandemic and to mobilize a society-wide response to gender-based violence. In the past year, we have come together with our social partners to end load shedding, to address the challenges in the logistics center, sector, to tackle crime and corruption, and to also accelerate job creation. This is the South African way of building a social compact, working together on tangible issues, and it will be the key to building a new society in the years to come. This is the last State of the Nation address of the Sixth Democratic Administration. Ngesizulu, unelizi eliti sizaubuya. Futi sizauti masbuile, abantu bazoti ibuile, ngoba izoba ibuile ngepele. Labo, abangati baya chabula. Umangiti, this is the last State of the Nation address. Bakabanga Uti Asina Ubuya, Siza Ubuya, Konala Bulenda. The last five years, the last five years have been a period of recovery, rebuilding, and renewal. We have had to revitalize our economy after more than a decade of poor economic performance. We have had to rebuild our public institutions after the era of state capture. We have had to recover from a devastating global pandemic that caused great misery and hardship that closed businesses and cost our nation many jobs and lives. And we have had to confront and overcome a debilitating electricity crisis that, despite significant improvement in recent months, continues to hold back our economy. We have come a long way in the last five years we have built on the achievements of the last three decades, and we have taken decisive measures to address the immediate challenges facing South Africans. We have restored the independence and capability of our law enforcement agencies to tackle corruption and crime. We have worked to advance the rights of persons with disability. We took great pride in making South African Sign Language the 12th official language of our country. We have safeguarded and promoted basic rights in our constitution, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, association and belief, we have defended, yes, media freedom, and we have also defended the independence of the judiciary. We have protected and advanced the rights of members of the LGBTQI plus community and continue to combat all forms of prejudice and intolerance, and particularly also to people with albinism. We have made significant progress on measures to grow our economy, 
to create jobs and to reduce poverty. While we have set in motion the process of renewal and reform, there is more work to be done to see these reforms through to the end. We will see the work that is underway that, and ensure that it goes ahead. Mishumo irai toma kahe mingwaha mitanu iko vera panda ido zura ich vera panda le yonke le misebenzi esaikala iza ukubega baya tanda noma abatandi iza ukubega and working with our partners we will be able to revive our economy. Yes, we will tackle and deal with the debilitating effects of load shedding, our ports, and the logistics. We will continue to strengthen our law enforcement institutions. And we will continue to tackle gender-based violence and fight corruption to make South Africa a safe place for all. We will continue to strengthen local government. The initiatives that I spoke to will go ahead. We will professionalize the public service and increase the capacity of the state so that the state can serve our people better. And we will ensure as the Auditor General has said, that we should hold those in office accountable and there should be consequence management for those who do wrong things. We will continue to position our economy to grow and compete in a changing world. And we will also support small businesses by providing funding by providing resources to small and medium enterprises and to give young people opportunities to thrive and to start their own businesses and to succeed and to provide social protection to the vulnerable. We will continue the work to improve the country's fiscal position and hold firm to a economic trajectory. We will use the opportunities provided by the African Free Continental Trade Area to increase our trade and expand our industries. We will continue to protect workers' rights and improve their well-being in places of work and to make sure that our workers are well treated. We will continue to build an inclusive economy, focusing on the empowerment of black people and women, South Africans. Yes, we will intensify land reform and pursue a just energy transition that leaves no one behind. Fellow South Africans, as we celebrate these 30 years of freedom, we must remain steadfast in our commitment to our constitutional democracy and its promise for a better life. We should not give in to those who resist the responsibility that the Constitution places on us to correct the injustices of the past and fundamentally transform our economy and society. We must remind these people of the obligation that the Constitution places on the state to progressively realize the rights of everyone to housing, health care, food, water, social security, safety, and education. By the same measure, we should not allow anyone to diminish vital democratic institutions, to denigrate our judiciary, or to challenge the constitutional authority of this parliament. 
We should not give in to those who seek to divide our nation, to incite violence, and undermine our democracy. As in the past, as in the future, the people of South Africa should stand together against any attempt to reverse the achievements of our democracy. As the chairperson of the Constitutional Assembly, I worked with many great leaders of our country to craft a constitution that truly reflects the will of South African people. As president, I see it as my primary duty to defend our constitution and to work every day to realize its promise. As we move forward, let us remember that it is up to us not anyone else, to determine the future of South Africa. We are not passive observers of our history. We are its authors. We are the builders of this country that we call home. As we look towards the next 30 years of freedom, we must choose the kind of country, and indeed the kind of world, we want to create for ourselves and our children. We are committed to a South Africa in which our common identity lies in our recognition of each other's humanity. We want a country in which every person is free to be exactly who, to be exactly who they are, regardless of their race, their gender, their sexual orientation, their ethnicity, or their religion. We want a country in which the same opportunities are available to every child, whether they are born in Senten, in Mdanzani, in Sikukuni, in Mitchell's Plain, or in Phoenix. We want a country in which the rule of law applies to everyone no matter how wealthy they are or what position they hold. As we continue the journey towards making this vision a reality, we are inspired by democracy's children, by their energy, by their creativity and their enthusiasm. We are inspired by the young people who have carried our hopes onto the global stage with their music, with their dance. We are inspired by, yes, the Grammy Award winner who won the Grammy Award recently, like Tyler. We are inspired by Bafana Bafana. We are also inspired by the Springboks. Yes, they inspire us. As we mark the 30th anniversary of our freedom, we are reminded of the words of our President Nelson Mandela, who said that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. That is where we are. And he said, I have taken time to rest to steal a view of the glorious vistas that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can rest only for a moment, for, the freedoms, for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not yet ended. Washo umandela, wati ise ndelendela. Indelendela, sila yena isampanili tili. Hutla meile hore, rita mai sila yena, rearata kapa rearati, seti rili tili. While we have come far, yes, we still have a long way to go. Like Madiba. We must keep moving. 
always forward, always onwards, towards the country of our dreams, always believing that our victory is certain, because indeed it is certain. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable President, uh, delegates and uh, members of Parliament. Please allow me at this point to thank the President for the address. After I have attended the, the, the joint, this joint sitting, members should rise and remain at their places until the procession has left the chamber. The guests in the gallery should remain seated until the judiciary has left and the ushers indicate that the doors are open. The procession led by the usher of the Black Road and the acting sergeant at arms will leave the chamber in the following order. The Speaker of the National Assembly, the Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the President, the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Deputy President, and then the Secretary to Parliament. Honorable members, that concludes the business for the day, and the joint sitting is adjourned. A hundred and five minutes and 16 pages. That is the State of the Nation Address 2024 delivered by President Cyril Ramaphosa. When we come back, all the reaction for you, Samkele Maseko, Sakina Kamwendo and Abra Barbia on the ground for us. A uh, wrangling reaction from the opposition benches and members of the ANC as well. So we'll have all that for you just now, including political analysis with our political editor Mzwandile Mbeje. Don't move.